We are going to continue our study of the Ten Commandments for the 21st century today. Uh, last week, we introduced this uh, plaque that was given to the church, the Cowboy Commandments. And I mentioned down at the bottom here, watch your mouth. It's actually the title of my sermon today. I had picked that title out before we got this plaque. I just wanted everybody to know that. Have you ever stopped to consider how much truth is in the songs that we teach our children? Once a famous theologian named Karl Barth, considered in his day one of the most intelligent people on the face of the earth, he was asked, what is the most profound thought you've ever encountered in all of your theological studies? He thought for just a moment and he replied, it would have to be this, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Something we've learned from childhood and yet is so profound. Now there's another children's song which uh, fits our message today, one that perhaps we need to Learn once again, and not only sing it, but put it into practice. The first verse says, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see, for the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. I remember learning that in children's church. And the verses that followed about little ears, what you hear, Little hands, what you do. Little feet, where you go. But the one that probably I needed to learn a little bit more back then, <clears throat> be careful, little mouth, what you say. As I reflect on my childhood, I got in trouble more over my mouth than anything else. I wasn't a fighter. I wasn't really bad because... More so, I was scared of what would happen, so I wasn't very adventurous that way. Most part, I did what I was told, but it was always my mouth that got me in trouble. When I was in uh, Christian grade school, from pre-kindergarten to second grade, uh, they had what they called tallies. They were kind of like demerits, if you know what those are. And if, if you broke one of the rules, you'd get a tally. And they'd have these little things in the front of their class with everyone's name on it, and you'd get these tallies. And at the end of every six weeks when they'd send out the report card, they would also send the number of tallies that you accumulated over that six-week period. If I remember correctly, the class average was about 11. And my totals were usually in the 60s. <clears throat> and it was always my mouth. Talk at the wrong time say the wrong thing, whatever it was. It gets very serious, though, when we consider what the Bible says about our words. The Lord cares about our speech. And in the third commandment, we read in Exodus 20, verse 7, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. You might be more familiar with the King James rendering of that. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, I remember learning that from a young age. But what does it mean to take God's name in vain? Now, the word vain means empty, idle, insincere, phony, frivolous, lacking in reality or truth. So taking God's name in vain would be to treat God lightly, irreverently, insincerely. We usually think of trouble speech or bad words as being profanity, swearing and cussing, and we're going to get to that. But you're going to find out that the Bible has a different 
use for the word profanity. And it's not only those four-letter words that you can't say on television. Oh, actually, you can say most of them on television anymore. But those words they would find socially unacceptable. Now, we're going to see that the third commandment goes beyond that. One of the resources that I had on the Ten Commandments lists 12 ways you can violate the third commandment. Don't worry, I don't have a 12-point sermon this morning. <clears throat> We're going to look at three areas of wrong speech that fall under this prohibition. We're going to see that Solomon was right when he writes in Proverbs 21, 23, He who guards his mouth and his tongue shall keep himself from calamity. I wish I had known that verse when I was younger. It would have saved me from a lot of pain, if you know what I mean. Now, the first area that's prohibited by the third commandment, I'm calling false speech. You know, we often think of sinful speech as, as profanity or, or swearing, but profanity includes more than that. Leviticus 19.12 states, Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of the Lord. I am your God. By swearing falsely, we profane God's name. Now, that can be in a very formal setting, such as in court, where you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me, God. And then if you were to speak falsely after taking that oath, you've actually committed a crime. It's called perjury. Now, did you know perjury is found in the Bible? It is. In Jeremiah 7, beginning in verse 9, the Lord, speaking to Israel, will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to other gods you have not known, then come and stand before, in me, before me in this house which bears my name and say, we're safe, safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. He mentions perjury in this passage. But there's more than just the official giving false testimony that falls into this category. We can say, I swear to God this is true. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody says to me, I swear to God this is true, red flags go up in my mind. I'm thinking, okay, here comes a whopper, right? You know? Honest to God, really? People that usually say that are lying. <laughs> and when we do and invoke God's name... That is taking his name in vain. That is profaning the name of the Lord. We are attaching God's name to falsehood when we know that God is truth. We are, in essence, dragging his name through the mud. Now, I'm not saying that all oath-taking is wrong. There are times when you're in court and you're told to, you know, put yourself under oath. Our elected leaders take an oath. Our military takes an oath. Those aren't wrong. It's when we swear falsely. It's when we have to bring God's name into our conversation just so the people will believe us. That's what Jesus was saying in Matthew 5 when he says, do not swear at all. Don't swear by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Don't swear by your head, because you cannot make even one hair white or black. That's before hair dye, by the way. <clears throat> Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Again, he's not saying that oaths in the proper context themselves are wrong. It's why do we use them? 
Do we have to invoke God's name just to be believed? If that's the case, that says something more about our character. Jesus says you ought to be the kind of people that when you say yes, people know you mean yes. And if you say no, it means no. And you don't have to add anything else. Don't use God's name as filler. (laughs) That's also using his name in vain. Now, all falsehood is prohibited. We should never speak something that is not true. Paul writes in Ephesians 4.25, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor for all members of one body. Elsewhere in that same letter he says, Speaking the truth in love. That should be our normal mode of communication. There's an old joke, I'm sure many of you have heard it. Don't mean to offend anybody in this occupation if you're listening. But, you know, how do you know if a lawyer is lying? His lips are moving, right? Okay, you know, we, we tell these, these jokes. But if you're the kind of person that when you say something, people really have to wonder, is it true? We've got a problem here with the third commandment. Because false speech is one way we can take God's name in vain. There's a second way. It's what I'm calling flippant speech. This is talk that is frivolous, superficial, even glib. Now, I'm not saying that telling a joke is wrong. I'm not saying that saying something funny that makes people laugh is wrong. I'm the last person on earth that think Christians ought to always be drab and dull. There's a place for humor. There's a place for lightheartedness. There's nothing wrong with that. Where we need to draw the line, though, is in using God's name frivolously. Using God's name flippantly. Insincerely. This is the opposite of what Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. We should honor God's name. We should not just use it flippantly. As the old saying goes, familiarity breeds contempt. Now, I'm not trying to step on anyone's toes in particular. I just want to share something personal for me. When I hear God referred to as the man upstairs, I have a problem with that. This is Almighty God we're talking about. And I don't believe we should refer to him in such a flippant manner. When we use phrases like, oh my God, or if we're texting it, OMG, it's the same thing. Or, good Lord, or... Something happens and we say, Jesus Christ. You've heard of the little boy who thought his name was Jesus Christ because that's what his dad said at the beginning of every time he yelled at him. Jesus Christ, what are you doing? That's using the Lord's name in a a frivolous or a flippant manner. The Bible takes names very seriously because the Bible associates a person's character to their name. When God revealed his name, he was revealing who he was, who he is. And to use his name so easily, so emptily, we're failing to take God seriously. There's the area of lip service. We're saying one thing, but we really don't mean it. We just kind of half-heartedly say it. We make promises we have no intention of keeping. A.W. Tozer used to say, Christians don't tell lies, they just sing them on Sunday morning. If we can sing songs of praise to God and we don't mean them, That's taking God's name in vain. I remember a time when I was in college. And you know institutional food has a reputation. It's not the best. 
Now, I happen to know the people that were making the food, so maybe I had a, a little more compassion towards them and, and, you know, tried to give them the benefit of the doubt. But I remember sitting down at lunch one day, and uh, one of my friends came by and sat across from me at the table. He sat down, bowed his head for maybe a second and a half, and as soon as he opened his eyes, he started ripping into the food and how awful it was and terrible and everything else. And I said, didn't you just thank God for that food? We say something and then turn right around and say the complete opposite. Sometimes we use God's name as, as filler in our speech, even in our prayers. Don't cheapen the name of God by using it in ways that are inappropriate. Now, there's a yet more serious misuse of God's name. We misuse God's name when our behavior is incompatible with his character. When we call God Father and mistrust him, when we call Jesus Lord and disobey him, aren't we using those names? frivolously we say God is our father we say Jesus is our Lord but do we live it do our lives back up what we say Proverbs 18 10 says the name of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous run to it and are safe how strong of a tower is it if it's something we just use in everyday language that doesn't mean anything I think we need to be careful about flippant speech. And then the third application of the third commandment is filthy speech. In Proverbs 10.32, Solomon writes, The lips of the righteous know what is fitting, but the mouth of the wicked only what is perverse. And boy, you do see this a lot, don't you? All around us. It's, it's filtering through movie screens and television screens, through lyrics of popular songs on the radio. Years ago, George Carlin used to speak of the seven words you can't say on television. I think it's down to two now. And I bet before too long there won't be any left. We keep lowering the standards of what can be said in public. And it used to be considered only the uneducated, only those with no class or, or no real character used such language. But now you hear it used in the halls of government, in courtrooms. Everybody seems to be using filthy language, even Christians. But Paul says in Ephesians 5, verses 3 and 4, Among you there must not even be a hint of immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Notice Paul mentions here obscenity. That's what we usually think of when someone swears or cusses. But he adds to that foolish talk. The Greek here is morologia. It comes from two words in the Greek. The first is from which we get moron. Ignorant. Stupid. And logia is word. Speech. You ever think about how stupid some things are that people say, especially if they're using profanity? I mean, it's one thing when somebody says, God damn so-and-so. We are calling on God to damn somebody to eternity. First of all, that's not our job. You leave the judging to God. That is God's prerogative, not ours. You tell somebody to go to hell. It's the same thing. We are ascribing them an eternity in a place where only God can send somebody. 
But how about when somebody says it's cold as hell outside? Isn't that the dumbest thing you've ever heard? Think about it. What is hell? It's a lake of fire. How cold can that be? I think that's what he's talking about with foolish talk. That's stupid. And yet, how often are things said like that? So much of what would be considered filthy speech is really dumb. It's just nonsensical. We say it, I don't know why exactly, to try to add emphasis, I suppose. James says in James 3.9, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and we curse our brother, made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. I remember hearing a conversation where somebody just rips out a, a string of profanities and the person looks at him and says, do you kiss your mouth with that mother? Do you kiss your mother with that mouth? It's even worse when you consider that God is hearing. D.L. Moody tells about when he was in the army. And this is back in the 1800s. And you know how soldiers and sailors can swear. And boy, they'd be just letting loose with profanities until a woman walked by. And then they'd clean up their speech. And he said, how sad that they have more respect for women than they do God. Every now and then somebody will either realize or remember my profession, and maybe they've been letting out some profanities, and they'll say, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Don't mean to offend you. I'm like, You're not offending me, but God is hearing you. It's not my commandment you're breaking, it's his. And even if we're all alone, even if nobody's around, God is still there. And he still hears what we say. We've got to be careful about what we are saying. I've used the word profanity quite a bit. It's interesting this last week to find out where that word came from in English. It literally means outside the church. And how it became used was the words that are used in church for worship are the same words used outside the church in a wrong way. Just like James said, we praise God in our worship, but then we turn right around and curse with the same mouth. That's really what profanity is. It's dragging God's name through the mud. My father was a truck driver. Nothing against truck drivers. They're just usually not known for their flowery speech. <clears throat> and he used to carry a card in his wallet. And it said, profanity is the attempt of the feeble mind to express itself forcibly. Never forgotten that. Profanity is the attempt of the feeble mind to express itself forcibly. <laughs> And I think back to so many times when I hear people cussing and swearing, and I think, that is exactly right. We're trying to add emphasis to what we're saying, and so we rattle off some four-letter words. Does it really do any good? Does it add any weight to what we're saying? Do people believe us more because we use that kind of language? And I think we've got to be careful as Christians because it has become acceptable even for Christians to swear. I've even heard some defend it and say, well, it lets me fit in with the other guys. We've got to draw a line of where we're going to fit in. And using God's name loosely is not a way to fit in. In fact, I wonder what it does to our testimony if we 
talk in that way and then try to tell them about Jesus. Are they really going to listen? How much damage do we do to our testimony by our words? Oftentimes, filthy language is the sin of thoughtlessness. We don't even realize what we're saying sometimes. And if it becomes a habit, it can be particularly degrading. I have heard people talking about God, talking about their faith, and interspersing the foulest of words in the same sentence. And if you tell them about it, they don't even realize it. They're not even thinking, and it comes out of their mouth. Remember the last half of the third commandment. He will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. God will not excuse a man for abusing his name because there is no excuse. When we misuse God's name, we show utter contempt for God. We fail to take God seriously. Now, this commandment, as many of the commandments are, are stated negatively. What we are not to do. I think what we find in the Lord's Prayer is the positive counterpart. The very second line, hallowed be thy name. What's that mean? That means honored. May God's name be honored by what we say as well as by what we do. So I think this third commandment has a lot to say to us in the 21st century. God is telling us very simply, watch your mouth. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. May it not be false speech. May it not be frivolous speech. May it not be filthy speech. There's a couple of very short prayers we find in the book of Psalms that I think would help us in this matter. Psalm 141 verse 3 says, Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Just imagine a sentry standing right before your mouth, and before anything comes out of it, it's there checking it. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice to have that kind of a guard? Some of us need a muzzle, but that's beside the point. Psalm 19, verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. What kind of a change would it make if we prayed those verses every day? If we carried those with us, Throughout our day, wherever we go, whatever we do, Lord, set a guard over my mouth. May my words be pleasing in your sight, because I guarantee you, the Father up above is listening with love. So be careful, little mouth, what you say. On the other hand, when we fill our mouths with words that build others up, that can show lost ones to the Savior, to praise our Father in heaven. It's surprising how the wrong kinds of talk find no room. Replace wrong kinds of speech with the right kind of speech. And we will find that we'll be living in conjunction with the third commandment. As we close this morning, I'd like us to... Take our hymnals, hymn number 378, hymn number 378. Some of you may remember when Dixie Montgomery was with us. At the end of all of our services on Sunday morning, she would play this song. I never asked her to do it. She did that on her own. It was always a fitting ending to our worship service. Take the name of Jesus with you. 
Now that we've learned something about him, take it with you wherever you go. And as we have focused this morning on honoring God's name, I think this is a fitting conclusion. We're going to sing the fourth verse. At the name of Jesus bowing, falling prostrate at his feet, King of kings in heaven will crown him when our journey is complete. We look forward to that day. Let's practice until we get there. Take the name of Jesus with you wherever you go and honor him by our lips and by our lives.